Hello, and welcome to the Sinobabel podcast. In this week's episode, we're returning to the Nanjing Decade, which is the period of Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist rule from 1927 to 1937, to discuss the development of the creative sphere at that time. So in this episode, we're talking about art, literature and film, and how they evolved during this period, to try and understand what the major themes and trends were, as well as to determine the extent of political influence on the art world at that time. I have a feeling this episode is going to be pretty long, but there's a lot fewer names and it's a lot less fact heavy than previous episodes because we're going to focus a bit more on sort of stylistic things, analysing themes and motifs and things like that and talking about people's debates about proper theoretical aspects of art. So hopefully it's a bit more of an easy listen, a bit more entertaining. You're not going to have to memorise lots of new names. There's quite a lot to go through, so we'll just jump right into it. So let's start with the development of the art. So this is like painting art during the 1930s. So it's pretty easy to divide the major trends in the art of this period into three main groups. So you've got the battle between old and new forms of art, the explosion of commercial art, and the use of new forms of art for political expression and commentary. All three of these areas were heavily influenced by China's now extremely close relationship with the West, which basically resulted in the introduction of Western art techniques and the establishment of both Western and Eastern businesses in China's urban centres. Luckily, or maybe unluckily for you guys, I'm actually researching the art of this era as part of my PhD project, so I have lots to say about this, and I'm hopefully going to put lots of examples as well on the Sinobabble website, so feel free to check that out after the episode. I could talk about this topic all day, but I promise I will try my very best to keep it as brief and to the point as possible. So the shift towards a greater appreciation of Western art and the need to teach Western styles and techniques in Chinese schools began sort of towards the end of the May 4th era and was led by a man called Tsai Yuanpei. Tsai Yuanpei was a modernist along the lines of Hu Shi, Chen Duxiu, the usual suspects that we usually mention in our episodes when we talk about modernization in China. I did mention him briefly because in 1916 he became the head of Beijing University, which made him kind of like the grand boss of all the revolutionary thinkers that we've mentioned before. And he actually hired most of them for that exact reason. He was one of those people who kind of forced Lucian into teaching and tried to get more and more people involved in his project to modernize China. He was like the chief revolutionary thinker. He actually resigned in protest in 1919 after the May the 4th movement when some of the student protesters were arrested, but he kept being rehired because he was just that amazing. And then later on in 1926, he teamed up with Chiang Kai-shek and joined the nationalist government to try and put the country back together again, using heavy Western influence to try and modernize education in particular. Just as an interesting aside, Tsai was also one of the witnesses at Chiang Kai-shek's marriage, um, his marriage to Song Meiling, not to the teenage girl that he gave syphilis. But anyway, what he wanted more than anything else was to transform the art education scene. In 1917, he wrote that the aesthetic should replace the religious. He hired several Western-educated Chinese artists and painters to run the National Art Academies, and he was one of the principal actors who brought the battle between new forms of art and guohua to a head. So guohua is basically uh, the Chinese way of saying Chinese painting. You've almost definitely seen one of these before. Most of them are kind of like a blank canvas with black ink. They're kind of very simplistic, straightforward paintings, usually of animals like uh, horses, birds, koi fish or flowers, sometimes people as well, or maybe even mountains and scenery, landscapes, that sort of thing. The style hadn't really changed for the past 1,000 years, and most of the newer paintings were basically imitations of the old style of paintings. So if you've ever been to, I don't know, a Chinese shop, a Chinese restaurant in China or in your own country, you've almost definitely seen this kind of painting before. It kind of looks like watercolours, but there isn't usually a lot of colour, and there isn't a lot of focus on trying to render perfect images. It's more like an outline of a figure. So you can tell that it's a fish or you can tell that it's a horse, but maybe they've only used a few strokes to outline it. So if you're thinking of like a stereotypical Chinese painting, you're probably on the right track. Most of the modernizers, so that's Tsai Yuanpei, Chen Duxiu, even people like Kang Youwei that we spoke about ages ago, 
They all believed that this imitation of the ancient forms was what was holding China back and preventing her from modernizing. So they encouraged young people to travel abroad, study either in Japan or in Europe, and come back and introduce new styles into China, which is exactly what they did. In the late 1920s and early 1930s, you had this debate between people who championed the old form and believed that the ancient Chinese style of painting was the best style of painting. And then you had these waves of modern Chinese artists who brought back things such as realism, surrealism, cubism, expressionism from the West and tried to use that to invigorate the Chinese art scene. The style that became the most prominent was realist painting. And then within realist painting, the main form was oil painting. Oil painting would go on to have a major influence in the People's Republic of China after 1949, because it was basically seen as a more scientific way of painting, which became really important. So basically trying to render as close to the real object as possible became a very important aspect of painting as opposed to just kind of having a freedom of expression and a more creative sort of bend to the work. Even amongst the new forms of art that were introduced like surrealism, expressionism, they all faded out in favour of realism and particularly within realism oil painting as well. Interestingly, Guohua or Chinese painting never really went away. And actually, if you look at a lot of the famous painters in China now who emerged after the 1980s, many of them are Guohua artists. And in fact, the majority of these young artists that I'm talking about in the 20s and 30s were trained not only in whatever Western styles they were interested in, but they were trained in Guohua as well. So they knew how to do um, sketching, they knew how to do watercolours, they knew how to use oil paints, they knew how to to do Chinese painting, calligraphy, all of these sorts of things. So most of these artists were actually very well-rounded. So the traditional style of Chinese painting was never really lost. It was just that people were trying to modernise it, trying to use new influences to try and push it on the track towards modernization. But you always had those staunch traditionalists who didn't want to give up their beloved traditional styles. So that debate didn't really ever come to a head or come to an end it kind of just went on throughout this period and then after the PRC it was kind of decided by the Chinese Communist Party that we were not doing the Guohua anymore basically so that's how that was resolved so besides the people who were entrenched in the war over modernization of traditional art forms artists in China's urban and commercial centers were beginning to champion new forms of art that allowed them to embrace brand new techniques that they'd never seen before, and also new subject matters for contemporary patrons and audiences. The forms I'm going to be talking about now are commercial sort of advertisement art, cartoons, and woodblock. Advertisement art usually was only used in China's urban centres. I'll mainly be talking about Shanghai here. This is the area that I know the best. So there were a lot of foreign firms that had opened up in Shanghai during the 1920s and more and more foreign businesses and foreign money were flowing into the area. Light industry commercial businesses in particular were taking off. So clothing, uh, cigarettes, alcohol, those sorts of things were becoming more and more popular. It was actually the Western companies that introduced the idea of having sort of advertisement art on their products or to advertise their products. But they found that the styles that they were using weren't really appealing to the native Chinese audience. So what they did was they turned to native Chinese artists to see if they could introduce new themes or introduce pre-existing Chinese themes that would be more attractive to a Chinese audience. So eventually a new style of art emerged called UFN Pai, or in English we would call that calendar posters. And again, an example of this will be put up on the Sinobubble website because me trying to explain how it looks is just not going to make a lot of sense, but I will do my very best. So basically what a UFM pie is, is it takes some of the elements of what's called a nianhua, which is a New Year's poster. So New Year's posters had been around in China for centuries and they were auspicious paintings, sometimes crudely done, usually very colourful, that celebrated the New Year's. So you would like stick them on your door. Some people still do. You might have seen some of these pictures of gods and goddesses or these chubby babies as well with bright rosy cheeks. So UFM Pi calendar posters borrowed really heavily from 
the Nian Hua style in that they took the idea of bright and colourful themes, but then they basically applied that to new images. And the main new image that was used was the image of young, beautiful women. These young, beautiful women, most of them, if you look at these posters, they kind of have the same face. They have a very pale face. It's round with a pointed chin. They've got nice, big, tilted eyes, a small nose and ruby red lips and bright red cheeks as well. And they usually have quite a modern hairstyle, usually sort of like a, a waved bob, or some of them also have traditional hairstyles as well. I really like these posters because they are such a good reflection of the time in that as you move from the late 20s into the early 30s, many of the women become more and more scantily clad to the point that many of them are topless. These aren't really images, like seeing so much flesh isn't really something that you would have seen a lot of before this period of time. So it's very interesting to see that as women's liberation moved forward, the art also moved forward to reflect the opening up of you know the world to women. Dresses became shorter, cleavage gets lower. So in some cases, their breasts are actually showing. And it's kind of a reflection of them throwing off the shackles of, say, uh, chastity, arranged marriage, the ability for women to go out and work and go out and participate in activities like going to the horse race, going to the swimming pool, that sort of thing. So in this way, even though they were posters that were used basically just for adverts, for products like cigarettes or whatever, they also reflected the advancement of the modern woman, which is quite interesting. Apart from the UF and Pi scene, you also had the emergence of the cartoon and comic scene. So cartoons and comics as a standalone style was very new to China before it was kind of seen as a low form of art. But as people were exposed more to the kind of satirical newspaper styles of the West, it became much more plenty. And in the 1930s, this was considered to be the golden age of cartoons. So a lot of people set up small studios and they took commissions for different adverts or comic book stories for children and other print work like book covers, illustrations for books and things like that. Some people even decorated enamel wear. And during this period, people who could do good cartoons, it didn't really matter what the style was, if it was surrealist or expressionist or really simple kind of newspaper style, they were in really high demand. In the early 1930s, most of these people were kind of apolitical or there weren't really that many political themes in the cartoons. There may have been some criticism of the nationalist government, for example, criticism of inflation, criticism of the gap between the very rich and the very poor, class divide, the situation of workers and things like that. Mainly it was kind of like a money making thing or something that people did because they enjoyed it and they enjoyed making stories and cartoons. It was only really after 1937 that you see more political, for example, more anti-Japanese cartoons coming out after Japan invades fully and the outbreak of the War of Resistance against Japan in 1937. That's really a major theme of all the different art styles that we're going to be talking about in literature and film as well. I don't want to talk about anything that happens after 1937 because that will be spoiling the surprise. But basically the entire art world shifts after this period of time. Before 1937, there's a bit more of a carefree atmosphere, even though the country still isn't back on its feet yet. People are a bit more hopeful because the Nanjing decade has kind of inspired this idea of, OK, China's back on track. But there's still this ongoing battle between the nationalists and the communists, and that comes to a head also in 1937. And just generally after 1937, everything kind of falls off a cliff and everything that was being built up disintegrates. So the early 1930s and mid 1930s really were the golden age of cartoons, but also the golden age of pretty much any other creative endeavor that people were interested in at the time. Okay, so the final art style that I want to talk about is woodblock, and in Chinese that's mu ke or mu ban. So woodblock printing was another art form that was heavily influenced by foreign styles and became gradually more and more politicised throughout the 1930s. So woodblock as a form of illustration actually dates back to the Tang Dynasty, so that's like the 7th century to the 10th century. And much like cartoons, it had frequently been dismissed as sort of a lowbrow form of art. It was only through the promotion of the new woodblock print movement, which was spearheaded by Lucian in the 1930s, that the potential for woodblock as an effective means of sort of spreading political messages became apparent. 
So Lu Xun was pretty much at the head of the woodblock movement. He established something called the Morning Flower Society. They set up their own journal and they published all these woodblock prints from Europe and the Soviet Union. And he also held several exhibitions and also some training courses as well so that more younger artists could be introduced to the style. So a lot of the people who got interested in woodblock were leftists. Not all of them were communists. But the Nanjing government, Chang's government, ended up attacking these people anyway because they felt that woodblock was kind of like a subversive form of art. A lot of people were using woodblock to criticise the government and their policies. So eventually the whole woodblock movement had to go underground. A lot of them got arrested and most of them ended up fleeing to the Yan'an base, which was the Chinese communist base in Shanxi province in northwestern China. So the woodblock movement in China's urban centres was very short lived. But ever since, Lucian has kind of been championed as the kind of godfather of the woodblock movement. And like most other things to do with Lucian, even though he was never a communist, to this day, the communists still use his name in vain, probably more than any other person. Okay, so that's it for art. Like I promised, it was relatively brief. I could have literally spoken about that for an hour. But anyway, let's move on to literature. So from my own reading, the Chinese literary history of the 1930s is a little bit weird. It's basically divided into two, I don't really know how you would describe it, kind of like camps or sections. So you had on one side the people who talked about literature and constantly debated about it, and then the people who actually wrote books. The period takes a similar developmental path to that of art in that literature as a whole becomes more and more entwined with politics as the social and political situation becomes more critical. But I would say overall literature was much more political than art, whereas art still had its enclaves where people were completely apolitical and just worried about the creativity. The literature scene became really dominated by a few really theoretically minded people. Some of the issues that were reflected in art were the invasion of Japan in 1931, the worsening domestic economy, the many failures of the Nanjing government to improve the general situation of society. You also had issues of modernity, how to modernise literature so that it properly reflected reality as opposed to remaining either stiff or kind of wishy-washy. And also the meta-political debate of whether or not literature should have anything to do with reality or class politics at all, or if it should just be an expression of the author's innermost feelings. Let's talk about the three main camps of literary theorists who are having these debates among themselves. So on the one hand, you had the leftists, and they were represented by the League of Left-Wing Writers, which was established in 1930, but ended up disbanding after only seven years because of all the infighting, On the right, you had the nationalist conservative types, but they weren't very successful in their attempts to create any unified theory of literature, and they were basically rejected very quickly as just being mouthpieces of the Nanjing government. And then you had the radical centrists. They basically believed in the Enlightenment version of literature, that writing was an autonomous activity, that it should be devoid of isms, and that it should have its own values that reflected eternal and universal human nature. We're going to be focusing on the battle between the left and the centre, mainly because the right didn't have anything to say, but also because the debate serves as the starting point for a major turning point that takes place in the 1940s, which is when Mao Zedong announces that art for art's sake is over and that all art should serve politics, which is the main policy after 1949 during the People's Republic. The League of Left-Wing Writers dominated the literary scene in the 1930s, And on their team were some of the heavyweights of the cultural world like Lucian and Chu Chou Bai. We already know who Lucian is from previous episodes, but we haven't met Chu yet, and I'll explain who he is in a bit. The basic tenets of the League were essentially that literature should be political in nature, and it should be revolutionary and proletarian. This basically meant that writers should be writing literature for the masses, that reflected the struggles of the proletariat from their perspective. How they were supposed to do this was never really outlined that clearly, But what was more important to the League was how they defined literature, which was as a tool and as a component of the propaganda of class struggle. Creativity was downplayed in favour of ideological correctness, which was a reflection of the makeup of the League itself. The majority of the leadership positions in the League were dominated by Communist Party members, except for Lucian, who, like I said earlier, had never joined the CCP, and was actually very critical of the more dogmatic members, 
This whole thing backfires on the league a bit later when they take the stance that anyone who isn't 100% with them is therefore their enemy and it ends up destroying the league in its entirety. The first major challenges of the league came in the form of the Crescent Moon Society, led primarily by literary theorist and English professor Liang Shichou. Liang had studied at Harvard and was a conservative humanist sort who hated Rousseau and the Romantics, and he argued that neither revolution nor class were any sort of basis for literary criticism. He got into a heated debate with Lucian, stating that true literature was art above class, it reflected true human nature, and what the leftists were producing was basically propaganda. He said, quote, We do not want advertisements, we want the goods. Lucian quickly shot back in what's often said to be his most passionate essay, stating that the fact that Liang thought that literature had nothing to do with class was a reflection of his class background in and of itself. Appreciation for literary creativity, he argued, was a luxury. How can an oil magnate understand the sorrow and suffering of an old Peking woman who picked charcoal for a living? Most people agreed with Lucian, even those who were not part of the League. Considering the political and social crisis that China was in, now was not really the time for ivory tower neutrality when it came to literature. Any tool that could be used to point out and improve the dire nature of China's situation should be used, and Liang's neutrality argument really lacked oomph. So Lucian and the leftists had won the first round, but the battle wasn't over. Other leftist writers who weren't part of the League challenged the dogmatic and dictatorial nature of the League calling out the overly political and propagandist nature of the literary theory. Theorists like Hu Qiuyuan, a young cultural critic who studied in Japan and probably knew more about Marxism than the Marxists, said that while literature could be political in nature, it still needed to truthfully reflect reality and should not be subordinated to political needs or overly rigid in its composition. He was criticised harshly by Chu Qiubai. Lucian's close friend and longtime communist, who had served as the leader of the party for a short while, before becoming a translator and writer in Shanghai. He pointed out that while literature could hold some aesthetic elements, it could never really be divorced from the socio-economic background of either the author or the context in which it was written. He did concede the point that the League was probably too strict in their if-you're-not-with-us-you're-against-us stance but also pointed out that in such turbulent times, there could be no middle ground, and fence-sitting would not be tolerated. While the League didn't call for people to join outright, they did promote the policy of the fellow traveller, which was basically a toning down of their previous ideological stance. And by the mid-1930s, those who won on the left still maintained friendly relations with the League, even if they tried to remain apolitical themselves. By this point, no one could really touch the left's dominance of the literary scene, but after their major battles against the centrists were over, the League squandered their opportunity to completely take over literature with their theories and ended up eating themselves instead. The communists in the group argued that all literature should contain the central theme of national defence, as a reflection of the new policy of the CCP, which was to create a national defence government after the invasion of Japan. They argued that this literature should show both present reality and a sort of romanticised progressive future after the left had triumphed against all its enemies. Their opposition, including veteran hero Lu Xun, stated that this was too authoritarian and came up with their own slogan, which was Mass Literature of the National Revolutionary War, which was more inclusive and reflected a broad literature that linked the proletarian struggle with the war against Japan. So in other words, it gave greater creative freedom under the umbrella of literature in general. The two sides duked out in the battle of words, but eventually the differences could not be resolved, and in 1936, the League dissolved entirely, reforming as the League of Left-Wing Writers and Artists, with some of the old members still included, but a noticeable lack of others, including Lucian. It's always seemed a bit weird to me that you've got this divide between the great figures of the cultural movement, who were all these literary theorists, and the people who actually wrote literature. So if we look at someone like Chu Bai, every Chinese person today would know who he was, partly because he was chairman of the CCP for a while, and he was also delegate for the party to the Soviet Union. But he's also celebrated as a martyr figure because he was executed when he was only 36. Today, he's remembered as someone who was deeply involved in the cultural scene and particularly in the literary revolution, but he never actually wrote anything except for essays and some poetry. 
but he's still considered a very important figure in Chinese communism. He even has his own museum. He did do some work for the romanization of Chinese, but it's almost as if his great contribution was evoking a sort of revolutionary spirit as opposed to actually producing anything tangible. Anyway, that's a big besides the point, but personally I just find it quite interesting that many of these people are considered to be important literary figures, but they don't actually have any famous works to speak of. So who did have the famous works? Let's talk about some of the actual writers. Unlike in the early 1920s, in the period that followed the May 4th movement, where you only had Lu Xun as a representative, the 1930s actually has quite a few creative writers who covered different styles and genre who were considered to be representative of the time, some of whom were political and some of whom were not. There was a lot of talent, but not everyone managed to make a lasting impact, especially those who decided to remain apolitical, as they were usually left out on the margins. It didn't help that the full invasion of Japan put a screeching halt to the literary development of most writers, but that is the major theme of this period, and those who didn't turn to the political or propaganda writing after 1937 weren't really in with a fighting chance of becoming well-renowned, especially after 1949, when the most celebrated writers were those who were clearly on the left. If we look at the themes of literature during this period, there's a clear move away from that May 4th individualist spirit. So you're moving away from the personal, the self-conscious, into the social political reality of the contemporary environment. So a lot of the writing is about class, poverty in the countryside, the Japanese invasion. There's a lot of new writing about the frontier region. And there's a lot of talk about the growth of the new urban youth in the wake of the May 4th movement. There's also a lot of contrast in tone. Some people are hopeful, celebratory, nationalist, while other people kind of wallow more in the misery and tragedy of the moment, or they kind of critique and write satires about what's going on with the government. And then other people choose a more escapist route. They're more romantic and reminiscent about either their old hometown or how China used to be. The major genres were, first of all, the zawen, or the miscellaneous essay, fiction writing, and poetry. The essay acted as sort of a social commentary and became an ideological weapon for the leftists. Once again, the great champion of this style was Lucian, but he was a very talented satirist and most people who tried to imitate him basically just didn't have his intellectual style, so eventually the genre just died out with a bit of a fizzle. Fiction was much more interesting, as it usually reflected the reality that the authors themselves witnessed, and it more and more represented new themes such as poverty in the countryside and people who generally lived outside of the bourgeoisie urban milieu. There was also the blossoming of a new genre, which was brought down by people who had fled Japanese invasion in Manchuria. These people basically began writing about their experiences and brought the idea of frontier literature into the mainstream. Poetry was similar to literature, but obviously the themes were expressed more in metaphor, in visuals and aesthetics, and it was much more symbolic than May 4th poetry, which was more concerned with freedom and new individualism. There were some anti-leftist poets who were less concerned with the realities and wanted to reflect a more apolitical aestheticism, but they were largely demonised by the left, and in the mid-1930s they were replaced in the mainstream by the more straightforward, simple and realist proletarian poets. I'm just going to talk about two writers here, just to give you an idea of what was going on. So the two writers I'm going to talk about are Mao Dun and Xiao Jun. Mao Jun was a fiction writer, and he is very, very famous in China. I think all Chinese people would probably know who he is. He's very highly praised for modernizing the traditional Chinese novel. That's his main claim to fame. He was a founding member of the League of Left-Wing Writers, and he contributed somewhat to the ideological battles with the other groups, but he concentrated more on his actual writing. The overall themes of his works revolved around tragedy, futility and the contradictions of a class-based society. Actually, Mao Dun was his pen name and it means contradiction in Chinese. So it was kind of chosen to express this instability and tension in the different ideologies of the 1920s and 1930s. A lot of his works deal with the bourgeoisie and urban intellectuals in contemporary China. His most exemplary work is a book called Ziye or Midnight which is a 500-page novel that weaves together several complex narratives about life in Shanghai in the 1920s and 1930s. 
It starts with the death of an old man who is dismayed about how decadent and lustful the youth have become and dies of a heart attack after seeing too much exposed flesh at a party. The story then follows his children and grandchildren who run various factories in the city, mistreating their workers, cheating their friends and rivals, and all of this is put against the background of military chaos raging between the nationalists, communists and warlords. It all comes to a head when the workers in the people's factories fight back against their low wages and maltreatment. I haven't read it myself, but it does sound very complex. Although, apparently, despite his attempts to shine a light on class conflict, the workers themselves are not prominently featured in the work. No doubt Lucian would argue that this was because his writing was marred by his own class background. The other writer I'll mention briefly is Xiao Jun. Uh, He is one of those writers who fled the Japanese invasion of Manchuria. He eventually met his wife, Xiao Hong, and together they became sort of the leaders of the anti-war leftist Manchurian writers. The great thing about Xiao Jun and Xiao Hong was that their pen names, when put together and read together, actually say Little Red Army, which I just think is really cute. Anyway, Xiao Jun's most famous work is called Village in August, which tells the story of an anti-Japanese guerrilla force of the People's Revolutionary Army as they fight against the local puppet army in Manchuria. It immediately launched his career, and it was the first contemporary Chinese novel to be translated into English. It was also used as a representative piece of war fiction that reflected the real experiences and emotions of the author, and that set off that trend of writing about war literature, which would really take off after 1937. Okay, so that sums up literature. I could not come up with a smooth transition to move us into film, so we're just going to go into film right now. The first films were brought into China by Westerners and played in Shanghai towards the end of the Qing dynasty in 1896. The popularity of the medium mushroomed so quickly that by 1905 there was enough demand for native Chinese to give filmmaking a go themselves. By 1926 there were 106 official cinemas in China, and this was not including unofficial venues that frequently played films such as YMCA's and tea houses. In 1925 there were 176 film studios nationwide, 144 of which were based in Shanghai. Although most of them went bankrupt before they actually even managed to get a film out, they still reflected the overall dramatic increase in the interest in the movie business. By the late 1920s, only a dozen studios or so were still in business, and only a couple of studios really had any influence at all. And as we'll see, they also became the nucleus for the political tensions that made their way into the film world as well. Many of the early filmmakers came from the theatre and Chinese opera world and brought their experience in writing, directing, acting and critiquing plays and operas to bear on the cinema industry. Some of them had studied overseas and so were familiar with Western styles of theatre and liked the style of play that was more reserved and realistic and less over the top than Chinese opera. When they came back to China, they adapted Western plays in a style that came to be known as Wenming drama or civilised drama. Though many of the prominent filmmakers of the period came from well-to-do middle-class families, film itself was still considered a low form of art for a long time. This was also very similar to how Chinese opera was treated, most likely because of the mass appeal of the genre. In traditional China, the best forms of art were those practiced by the educated elite, and were for the educated elite, and they were seen to be too lofty or expensive to be enjoyed by the unwashed masses. Film, on the other hand, was seen as just basically a get-rich-quick scheme, and many intellectuals felt that it had nothing to do with art whatsoever. Because of this stigma, becoming an actor or actress was not seen as a glamorous or appropriate middle-class profession, and actresses were frequently compared to courtesans, subject to intense media scrutiny, paid poorly, and publicly judged and often shamed for their on-screen and private acts. They did wield some influence in the social sphere, kind of like movie stars today, but the pressure of the lifestyle often got to them in the worst way, which is demonstrated by a number of high-profile suicide cases during the 1930s, which we'll talk about more in the episode on feminism. Even though many of the big players in the film industry were those who had foreign education and were won over by the ideals of the new culture movement, The idea of a modern progressive China wasn't really reflected in the most popular films of the 1920s. Most of the most popular films were actually those adapted from traditional Chinese folktales and classical literature, 
and involved martial arts, the supernatural, ghosts, knight errants, and over-the-top love stories. These films reflected the escapist literature that was very popular in urban centres, known as Mandarin Duck and Butterfly Literature, which acted as a foil to the new culture literature, as it tended to focus on the fanciful, like tales of revenge or modern love stories, that relied on the sentimental and cliched. We mentioned this kind of literature in the episode on the May the 4th movement. It's not really a trend, so to speak. It was just kind of there. It didn't really go anywhere or contribute to developing literature at all. It was just part of the escapist literature of the 1920s to help people get their minds off how not very good life in the city was at the time. In any case, these sorts of films had mass appeal and they needed to, otherwise the studios would go out of business. So in its early phase, nationalist cinema was pretty apolitical. In the early 1930s, two things changed. First of all, a group of May 4th intellectuals entered the film scene and started to work for the country's biggest film studios. And secondly, Japan invaded Manchuria, which I've mentioned several times already, in 1931, which invigorated a nationalist patriotic spirit among the general Chinese populace. So the arrival of progressive intellectuals on the filmmaking scene pretty much spelled the end for the martial arts ghost film genre and marked the beginning of a new trend in making films with a serious political message. Though some of these intellectuals were communists, their political identity was kept secret and they were able to work alongside even committed nationalists and rightists as both the left and the right felt the need to develop a film industry that played a positive role in Chinese society. The largest and most powerful film studios at the time were Mingxing and Lianhua. Both studios had the aim of elevating the tastes of the average moviegoer, and they wanted to eradicate what they considered to be trash movies in favour of films that could enlighten the masses and elevate cinema as an art form. They started churning out movies that showed the triumph of the good, usually represented by modernity, progress, education, over evil, usually represented by outdated customs, and the evil acts of the warlords. Lianhua Studio in particular had very close links with Chang's government and often produced films that overtly supported the government's social policies. One such film was called Sister Flowers, made in 1933. It tells the story of twin sisters separated as children, one who goes on to become the concubine of a warlord and the other who marries a humble carpenter. The poor sister ends up working for the rich sister after she is forced to flee her home for the city. Her rich sister does not recognise her, however, and treats her cruelly. The film points out the hardships faced by the working poor in China, from both natural and man-made disasters, but then uses a traditional values sort of twist to solve the issues. When the rich sister recognises her twin and her mother, she becomes the filial daughter, repenting for her previous behaviour and providing a good living for both of them. She didn't really learn the error of her ways so much as the error of her treatment of her family members along a conservative Confucian line of thought. Filmmakers who pandered to traditional Confucian values in keeping with the nationalist government's rhetoric were heavily criticised by leftists for making films that basically only spoke to the urban bourgeoisie, who were seen by the left as those who saw society's problems but thought they could solve them without actually changing anything about their behaviour. The left-leaning filmmakers produced films that showed the plight of factory workers, the realities of child labour, the double-edged sword of modern femininity, and the need for national salvation. The invasion of Japan spurred on the creation of films with patriotic themes, often with anti-Japanese sentiments. Newsreels and documentaries that outlined the war of resistance became increasingly popular as Chinese intellectual and cultural life was reoriented by the aggression of the Japanese army, and films were made with titles such as Mourning Ceremonies of the Soldiers, and Blood War of Resistance to Japan. Two narrative feature-length films with patriotic themes were National Salvation and Feng Yu Arunu. National Salvation tells the story of a factory worker and a woman abandoned by her husband, who flee their homes in the provinces after being bombed by the Japanese, and then join a volunteer army to help fight against them. The film's final message, that banding together and fighting against oppressors will lead to national salvation, was meant to be directed at both the Japanese invaders and the idea of domestic oppression. Feng Yu Arunu tells the story of a bourgeois poet and intellectual and how he transforms into a soldier who goes on to fight against the Japanese in the north. 
The theme song, March of the Volunteers, was extremely popular, and you would probably recognise it today as the national anthem of the People's Republic of China. So that just goes to show how influential film really was at the time. But despite these films that reflected the social and cultural reality of the 1930s, not all demand for escapist film had actually disappeared, a bit like with literature. There was still some apolitical bent to filmmaking, and these people who made non-political films were proponents of what's called soft cinema. And they argued that what the leftists were making was basically propaganda, not art, and that film should be, should be ice cream for the eyes. One example of such soft cinema was a film called Hua Shen Gunyang, where the protagonist must pretend to be a boy because her parents are worried that the child's grandparents will not treat her well if they find out that she's a girl. A highly predictable love triangle ensues, and in the end all is righted and the girl and the guy get together and the parents have a baby boy anyway. This kind of movie was popular for a while among audiences who wanted a bit of an escape, again, from the misery and drudgery of daily life, but like most things, this genre came to a quick end with the outbreak of Total War in 1937. We can't really talk about the film industry without talking about censorship. As the industry boomed in the 20s and 30s, the nationalist government took a greater interest in censoring inappropriate content. Much like the woodblock art scene, a lot of the government's censorship was aimed at stamping out leftism and any signs of communism in cinema. However, probably the major target of government censorship was foreign film being shown in China. The majority of films screened in China were foreign, about 90% a year from 1920 to 1949, with Chinese films never making up more than 15% of the market. A lot of these were played in the more luxurious theatres owned by foreigners and aimed at a more upmarket audience, namely educated Chinese bourgeoisie, and foreigners living in the foreign concessions in rich urban coastal cities like Shanghai. A lot of the censorship was generated by public outrage at the portrayal of Chinese people in Hollywood movies, which was usually as gamblers, opium smokers, prostitutes, swindlers, and just all around not great people. People were outraged at how Western films so casually portrayed white people's racial superiority, and demanded that the government do something about it. The Nanjing government didn't act until 1928, when it issued a law banning the screening of films contemptuous of the dignity of the Chinese people. Most cinemas in the foreign concessions ignored the law, as they were outside Chinese jurisdiction anyway, but following a series of protests over the film Welcome Danger in 1930, the Shanghai Mixed Court, which is the colonial institution that mediated between the Chinese and the British governments, ordered that the film be removed from the country and that the American ambassador formally apologised to China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. From that point on, filmmakers were a lot more careful with the portrayal of the Chinese. After all, China was a growing market for foreign films and Hollywood didn't want to miss out on a slice of the action. However, unclear guidelines meant that foreigners often couldn't help misstepping, and around 30 American films were banned in China between 1936 and 1937 alone. Apart from trying to control other studios' productions, the nationalists actually dabbled in film production themselves. The KMT government set up the Central Film Studio in 1934, under the control of the Propaganda Department. The main purpose of this studio was basically to produce highly nationalistic, extremely anti-communist propaganda films, and between 1934 and 1937, it produced over 200 newsreels, educational films, and specific titles addressing issues of national turmoil and anti-communist bandit suppression. The aim was to create a propaganda state media programme modelled on those of Japan and some European nations like Italy, in order to fashion a cult of the leader for Chiang Kai-shek. However, in the end, China's poor infrastructure, lack of cultural unity and a lack of funding for the film industry in general meant that these grand plans remained great in theory, but unimplementable in practice. So that's the basic overview of art, literature and film during this period. Before I wrap it up, I just want to talk a little bit more about the main themes, because I feel like the same themes run through all three types of media. The non-political themes I want to talk about first are those of exploration, discovery, modernization, and commercialism. I think it's clear that Western art forms had a very strong influence on all three of these mediums during the 1930s, especially because so many Chinese students had gone abroad to study in the 1920s, and then when they came back looking for jobs, 
or looking to express themselves creatively in the 1930s, they ended up in cinema or writing books or arguing about how to write books or in art. I think the scene at this time was very open, even though you had the nationalists trying to suppress any sort of leftist or communist inklings. Because the nationalists weren't very organised, they didn't have complete control over the country, and most of Shanghai was basically protected by the foreign enclaves, and the nationalists couldn't really do that much to control people's private and commercial activities. The leftist scene was able to grow anyway, even if a lot of it had to grow underground. There was still a lot of space for people to express themselves creatively. Even if people had to publish their work out of their own pocket, they were still able to kind of get the message out there because there were all these societies set up like the left wing writers and the left wing artists associations to support them. Also, they had people like Sai Yuan Pei at the head of these art institutions who basically just encouraged people to do whatever they wanted and to bring in as much Western influence as possible. I guess the main goal of people in all three industries was to move in a progressive direction and basically become more and more modern, especially in art. The main thrust of most of the debates in art were how to become more modern and how to modernise art. And the West was seen as that model for modernisation at this point. They weren't really following their own track or forging their own path or thinking about how it could be modernised from a Chinese perspective. A lot of it was derived from well, this is what the West has done, how can we apply that to what we're trying to do right now? Another major theme was that of commercialism that affected how certain art forms developed. For example, in cinema, most of the cinemas were owned by big investors and they just wanted to make a return on money. So they were basically only interested in making films that sold. So if that was the Mandarin Duck and Butterfly frivolous kind of art, then that's fine, we're doing that. If people want more serious political stuff, that's fine, we're doing that. So the kind of financial commercial aspect of it had did have a really big impact on how different art forms developed. In painting and actual art as well, advertisements were able to kind of reflect how society was trying to modernise, especially from the perspective of women, how women had more freedom, both in love and the activities that they did, how they dressed, things like that. But I think the main theme, without a doubt, is that of politics. I think in all artistic avenues, there was a battle waged between the left and the right, or in the case of literature, the left and the centre. And even though the communists had to keep a low profile after the Shanghai massacre and all the other attacks on the communists during the 1930s, they still had a lot of support and the advocates of leftist values still did what they could to give the communists a lot of space. And that meant that even though the communist party itself wasn't organised, a lot of communists were able to get into positions of power, for example, in the League of Left Wing Writers. The main reason that the left was able to get such a strong political foothold in the art world was because the left, or the communists, were usually very proactive, whereas the nationalists were always reactive or reactionary. The nationalists were never able to really get their unified theory out there in the art world. They were much more focused on the politics and the social scene and also waging war on all of their enemies. They also didn't want to piss off the Japanese too much. So they were a lot more focused on kind of censoring or tamping down on art that was too critical of the Japanese because they were trying to stave off this total war situation that eventually erupted after 1937. So the nationalists basically knew that they weren't a match for the Japanese and were trying to keep anti-Japanese sentiment to a minimum. But that didn't really work because I guess the people really knew what was going on. I think this is a really interesting and rich time for art because it's not only a time where the scene is kind of developing, it's moving away from its traditional roots, but it is when people are very focused on reflecting the reality of the time. And the reality of the time was very interesting. You not only had domestic intrigue going on between the nationalists and the communists, but you had all of these foreign influences coming in, as well as the invasion of Japan in China's frontier regions. So that is the art world in China during the Nanjing decade, and those were all the major themes. So I hope you enjoyed this episode, guys. I think the next podcast I do is going to be a modern China podcast. I think I want to talk about uh, the idea of disappearing people. I know there's been a lot going on in Hong Kong at the moment, but I don't feel very prepared to talk about that right now. I might have to wait even for a few months before I can maybe give a summary episode about everything that's happened especially if the whole situation dies down a little bit, I think that would be more appropriate. 
But for now, I'm going to be doing more of the episodes on historical China and modern China episodes. So I hope you're looking forward to them. That's it for this week, guys. And I hope to see you in the next episode.